Hey everyone, it's Richard Harris and Scott Lees with another episode of the Surf and Sales Podcast brought to you by Salesforce Revenue Cloud, gong.io, who's actually having their upcoming Celebrate uh, in the yeah. next week, I believe, right? One day, all day, virtual revenue conference. Yep. That's right. So, 23rd, go, I think. Yep. So please go check them out. Um, I went to it last year in person. I think uh, last year was Steve Kerr. This year's Magic Johnson is the keynote. So certainly worth that for sure. Um, Long must be big basketball fans. Yes. Uh, so Salesforce Revenue Cloud, gong.io and lead411. So please check those folks out. And I'm going to jump in and hope I don't butcher this uh, and welcome Jeff Bajoric. Jeff, is that, is that it? All right. That's it. So Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. And just, you know, from a contextual standpoint, you know, tell people what you do, what you're up to, you know, at, at a high level. At a high level, I help salespeople and sales organizations perform better. Um, I, there are really only a couple things you can do to sell more, and that is spend more time selling and advance the sales process at every possible opportunity. And there are things that get in the way. So I help organizations remove the things that get in the way, and I pour rocket fuel on the stuff that helps them move forward. So what um, gets in the way? That's the first. Oh, thing. man. Um, more often than not, uh, the seller gets in their own way. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote um, a little piece published, a white paper called uh, You Don't Have a Closing Problem. And what I did was I identified 16 other problems that you have. And if you put all those pieces in, the last piece of the puzzle is the closing problem. You know right where to put it, you know right where it goes, you know the way it's oriented, all those things, super easy. Um, but the, the biggest piece that is missing is belief. You got to believe that you offer something differentiated to your customer. You got to believe that that solution is going to help them um, you, you know, solve a problem that they have or help them get somewhere. Maybe it's not always, it's not always a problem. So you got to help them get someplace that they want to go. And um, you got to wake up every day. This game's hard enough. You got to wake up every day, believing you can win, even when you're not winning at the moment. And that is so hard to do. Um, so I, I think that's the biggest piece. And um, it's actually when, when I start clients off, we go through an exercise and kind of loosely branded with my podcast, the why and the buy, but we ask people a, a series of questions that help them understand why they're choosing to do what they do for the company they do it for. And what's really interesting is everybody in the room realizes they're on the same page. They realize they have a lot in common with everybody else. And they remember that the reasons they do what they do are also very good reasons for the customer to buy from them. And um, it's just really good mojo and, and gets things moving in the right direction. But if you don't believe, then you're going to have a hard time. And you put up those barriers and you're given so many opportunities to put up those barriers because um, what we do is not easy, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to take you back a few years and tell you this funny story, but I, I, want to, I want to ultimately end up learning what you learned from this person. So years ago, I, I wrote an article, I think it was for Sales Hacker, <clears throat> and my, my cell phone goes off and I say, hey, this is Scott, and the other line goes, Scott, get him her. <laughs> Just like that. Yep. I'm like, who? <laughs> He's like, get him her. Just repeats it. And I'm like, uh, Jeff, get him her. Like little red book of selling <laughs> Jeff, get him her. He's like, yeah. He's like, I read this article. Never heard of you before. Trying to figure out who you are. Thought I'd give you a call. And that was the beginning of my relationship and introduction to uh, Jeffrey Gittimer, the self-proclaimed king of sales. Mm -hmm. You worked with him, for him, mm -hmm. one of the certified trainers. I thought you might appreciate that story. I want to know what you learned from that experience that you carried with you. Wow. Where do I start? Um, long time. I'm going to go back more than a couple of years. I'm going to go back to um, spring of 2005. I'm working in my first sales job. I'm like nine months in. And I don't know which way's up because I wasn't given, not for anybody's fault, but um, wasn't, wasn't given the direction that I needed. And I was at a sales training meeting in Lansing, Michigan, driving home to Dearborn, Michigan. And there was uh, a Borders Books uh, on the way home and $20 burning a hole in my pocket. And someone at the sales training meeting recommended I pick up the Little Red Book of Selling. So I picked it up and I read that book. I, start, I gave that book away five times before I finished reading it because I'd get another couple of pages in. I was like, oh my God, you need, and I'd give it to somebody. I'm like, check this out. 
So finally, the copy I have now, um, my wife bought for me for Christmas and inscribed it to me so I couldn't give it away. It's the only reason I ever finished it. Um, fast forward several years, I decided that I wanted to do something different with my career. It was the greatest sales job I'd ever had, really good company, but I grew really, really quickly and then plateaued a little bit. The company didn't have a lot of new products uh, and it, the, the, the position was, was really stale for me. And uh, I wanted to get out of medical device sales altogether. So I decided that, um, you know, maybe I could coach. Maybe I could train a little bit. I think I know I'm doing some things right. I think I'm doing them differently than some of my colleagues. I, and I've, I've got an interest in making people better. Um, so I, I, I respond to this thing from Jeffrey Gittimer. It's a LinkedIn message that I'm sure went out to 10,000 people. And uh, he basically invited me to go to this weekend, spend this weekend at a seminar licensing his content. And... Um, I went to this meeting, it was the first sales meeting I'd ever been to where I did not know anybody else in the room. We weren't given a pre-registration list, nothing. I didn't know anybody else in the room. Nobody knew me. And it was the first time I could size myself up against other people who were doing this. And I remember there was a moment, it was at a Marriott downtown in Charlotte. And I was, we were on a break and I'm just kind of looking out the window. And Jeffrey comes over and he says, you get it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. I feel like I, I belong here. Right. So go through the weekend is great. He was giving me hell about being from Detroit and all these other things, because if he's not giving you shit, he doesn't like you. And um, anyway, I started just participating. I licensed some of his content, was using some of his stuff with my training, uh, developing my own. And I told him early on, I said, look, here's the thing. You don't need me to help you sell books and I'm not going to make a name for myself on your stuff. And he's like, oh, yeah, you have to start writing your stuff. This is meant to be a boost, not a career. I said, okay. And uh, just got more involved with him. There were some different projects that, you know, he, he asked me to help kind of take on for him. And um, it was really, really cool. I mean, going to Charlotte, staying at his place um, in, in the, the lofts there, he's got a bunch of them all tied together. One's a home, one's a, uh, an office, one's a library. This library is ridiculous. And uh, I, I really, what I really learned from Jeffrey were, was a couple of things. One, you have to take responsibility. It's nobody's fault but yours. You either made the sale or you didn't. Um, fix it if you want it to be better. Like dig in, look yourself in the mirror, figure out what you can change in order to be more successful. And uh, the other thing was that, dude, what you see is exactly who he is all the time. There is no facade. There is no question of authenticity. That man lives selling to the point where it's just what he does all day, every day. And um, like, like I've never seen someone so authentically tied and bound to what they do. Like I feel, I, I feel like I over identify with what I do for a living. No, he is what he does for a living. So what you see is absolutely what you get. And I am, as soon as you, like you got halfway through that story to um, Scott and I'm like, oh, this is, it, get him her, right? And you're like, get him her. <laughs> That's just perfect. That's so funny. The, the sad part is Scott's never been able to leverage that to get Gittimer on the podcast. So, yeah. whoa, 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 jeez! I, I'll tell you, for here. I'll tell you, knowing, one of the knowing Scott, he's holding out so that he can do it without me. I know Scott. So. <laughs> one, one of the one of the proudest moments that I can think of. This is one of the most fun times I've ever had on a podcast. It was a couple of years ago, and uh, I was talking with Jeffrey. We were still doing a fair amount of work together, and I was talking to Jeffrey about golf. Because I've been tinkering with this idea of doing like an experiential kind of like what you guys do with surf and sales, but with golf, because I, I, I like the golf. And uh, I asked him, I, I said, you know, what do you what do they call it? Uh, what do they call a mulligan in Scotland? And uh, he says, what? And I said, they call it hitting three. And he like absolutely genuinely belly laughed. Like he's a fun guy. He laughs at things. He likes to, to, to joke around and things like that. But he's normally, the, the joke's normally on you, right? And he's just very clever, very um, incisive in that way. But the absolutely genuine belly laugh that I got out of him, I'm so glad that I have it recorded because it's just, it, it's so cool to, to have that kind of interaction with someone you look up to so much. Yeah. I, wanna, I wanna come back out. How did you know like, if you think about, like, I always love to ask these questions, like going back to childhood, how did you know you wanted to be more into the teaching mode when it came to sales than, you know, the practitioner? Not, and believe, believe me, in, in what you do and what all three of us do, we're still practitioners just in a different sure. way. Um, what was that click for you? 
Um, so I, my degree is in athletic medicine. And I only tell you that because the, the major had 69 credit hours associated with it. So I didn't need to get a minor. Um, but I was like two classes short of having a minor in athletic coaching to kind of complement um, just my sports background and, and things like that. So I've always had this interest in talent development and performance, um, but never really needed to do anything formal with it. Uh, get out a few years, um, leave my job at the hospital on a lark, basically, hey, what the hell, let's try this selling thing for a year. And if it sucks, I'll go back to working in the hospital. And um, I almost made it that year. And finally, someone joined our organization. I won't mention his name because he won't come on my podcast. And so until he does that, I won't mention his name. And um, I finally had someone who could show me the ropes. And when I started seeing things so much more clearly and seeing that um, taking sales is something that I thought other people did, like that wasn't like that just, that wasn't going to be for me. I was just going to give this a shot seeing how I could use my talent, use the way I solve problems, use the way I relate to people to really constructively solve problems for other people. Um, and showing, having someone show me how much fun it could be at the same time. I was like, Oh, I got to help other people do this. Someone's doing this for me. It literally has changed my life. I have to, I have to do this for other people. And so it was uh, almost a year, maybe a year and a half into my sales career where I started to realize um, what it was all about. I was like, oh man, there's too many people out there like me who don't know what this is all about. And I want to be a part of that. Do you feel like, do you feel like you are still selling? I'm curious if both, for both of you actually, like how often do you feel like you're selling in the, in the conversations that you're having with, you know, prospects, clients, you know, things, things, things like that. Like I, I was thinking about this the other day because somebody asked me and I'm like, well, I technically am selling all the time, but I really don't feel like I'm selling anymore. I don't have that same feeling of selling I did 16 years ago when I was like pounding the phones and things like that. I'm curious if you feel like you're really selling anymore it's changed a little bit for me um but not to the same extent you know i've been doing this long enough i've put enough stuff out there there are enough people who have heard of me that it's a little bit easier of a of a proposition um but that also in some ways creates some other issues um there's nothing to me like getting that first objection that you're not prepared for. The, the, your face gets a little flush. You feel your blood pressure go up a little bit. Like that's excitement. Like to me, that's a bit of a turn on. And, and I love that. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's the, the, it, it's being in the game, right? I mean, it's the, the, we're, we're late in the game and, and I'm coming up to bat. Um, so I, I really do enjoy that. I don't feel that so much. Um, but I also think a little bit differently around what I do. And every time I coach somebody, every time yeah. I um, consult with somebody, every time I'm training, like I'm selling an idea. And a lot of times um, the extent to which I feel I'm selling is related to how big that, that hurdle is to overcome. Like if I've got someone who just doesn't believe in themselves at all, but says they do, or uh, if I've got someone who just can't see it a certain way, but I know what there's a, a win on the other end of it, um, I'll turn it on a little bit, um, but in are some you, ways- are you, too, walking, you know, are you walking away from deals? And how would you help identify, how would you help coach somebody to know when to walk away from, you know, a particular deal where, you know, maybe you're having to quote unquote sell like too much or too hard, or somebody's going to be like a nightmare kind of prospect. How, have you learned to identify that? And, and oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you will never have a better day in sales than when you fire your worst customer. Yeah. But tweet that like I already have, but go ahead tweet anyway. Um, the, uh, so yeah, I've learned. And, and to me, it's really a gut feeling, right? And I had this back in the field. I remember calling my manager and saying, look, we're the, the cupboard's dry here, dude. Like we're coming up with um, here's some people that want our stuff. I'm out here selling. We've got a ton of market share, but I'm trying to find these little outlying hospitals and surgery centers and things like that. Here's the deal. They're willing to buy from us. But we're going to have to cut our price. They're going to be pain in the ass customers. They're going to want stuff we don't have, and they're not going to want to pay for it. But Pete, you got a, a number to hit and, and so do I. And my manager, um, his name was Peter Clem. He's, I mean, great guy. 
I've had good managers and I've had bad managers. Pete was one of the good ones for sure. And he's like, Jeff, that's not going to be worth it. Let's just, let's just walk away. And I've brought on clients in the past, you know, just getting my business started, you know, and you bring on clients. It's like, you know, I remember talking to my wife about this. I said, you know, I don't know if this is a great client for me, but I think this, maybe this will test my boundaries. Maybe this will help me grow a little bit. Um, let me tell you this. If you feel like a client might be willing to test your boundaries, your boundaries don't need to be tested. That's all the test they need. You recognize that someone's going to push you a little bit in a way you don't want to be pushed. Walk away, go find someone else. Because the short term that I worked with those clients, it, it wrecked me for my good clients. Right. Yeah. I mean, I still did good work, but I knew I wasn't on my game because there was something eating at me or someone wanted something they shouldn't have been asking. And most of often it's because they weren't doing the things that I told them to do anyway. And then they were asking me why I wasn't telling them to do those things. I'm like, it's all right. It's in the email. You didn't yes. open like the thing you specifically asked me for that I gave you. Um, you didn't look at it. I can't help you. Yeah. There's nothing worse than somebody who comes to you, asks for advice. You deliver said advice. <laughs> And then they don't implement it. And then they ask again. And you're like, what do you mean? I, I told you exactly what to do this. And like, why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> what? The email is dated. There's a timestamp there. <laughs> timestamp on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to answer in the interest of time and some other questions, but I know you directed that to both of us. So I'm not going to, just don't want people to think I'm afraid of Scott and his questions. I'm not, he knows that. <laughs> so, um, a thought that, that sort of that, that comes up to you is, and they're, they're kind of, they're definitely tied together, I think, but I'll, the first question is, you know, what are the most common mistakes AEs are making right now? The co most common mistakes that AEs are making? Um, I it could be the same one from 10 years ago. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think um, no one's got enough pipeline. I think they're, they're overestimating their ability to close deals. I think they're underestimating the amount of time it takes to close those deals. Um, I think they're pawning off prospecting on somebody else. Um, what, so is 3X pipeline the number? Scott loves to tell people, just go for 10X pipeline, then you can stop worrying about it. Yes, that's exactly right. what I tell people. I, why, I mean, look, everybody's numbers are gonna be different. And everybody, you know, all politics are local, so to speak. So you know your territory. You're listening to this right now. You ask yourself, could you have more pipeline? And then ask yourself what you would, what your day would be like, what your job would be like, what your, um, what, you, what your level of fun would be like if you had more pipeline. You know, um, I noticed something early in my career. It's about, it's about four years into my career, almost halfway through my orthopedic sales career. I learned that at the end of the month, after I had my my number covered, right, that last week of the month. I was free. I sold better. I had more fun. I took more risks. I had a lot more swagger. And you know what? I sold more than I did earlier in the month when I was playing it too rigid, too conservatively, right? When any deal means too much, it's going to have an unnecessary and inordinate amount of uh, sway and power over your attitude, over your mindset. So what I had to do was decide, hey, I'm going to sell like I've already hit my number. Let's just, you know, break the chains, so to speak, and just just go get them. I've never had more fun. And it's it's a stretch because we, we kind of owe so much to quota and, and we, we kind of judge ourselves unfairly against it. Like it becomes a reflection on us personally rather than, you know, professionally and bad months happen to us all. You can't let that knock you down. Um, but just recognizing that I was holding myself back because I didn't feel like I had the ability to turn any deal down. And that changes with pipeline. And, and so, you know, is it three X could be, but that's probably a good place to start. You know, you could argue with me and say two X, you could argue with me if you really, really qualify your, your deals well, that maybe 1.5 X, but um, if it could be 10, why isn't it? Is it just cause you don't want it to be? Is it just because you don't see the value in that? You know, when, when you look at the, the top performers and I'll go back to Gittimer, Gittimer said this really early on. He's like, great salespeople, they laugh at the idea of quota. You, you know, you've got poor salespeople who are scared by quota. You've got decent salespeople who pay attention to it. And you've got great salespeople who don't care what it is. And um, pipeline is the missing link between those three kinds of salespeople. Now, 
what, let me ask a follow-up question, which is, what is the most commonly missed piece of the sales process or sales playbook from the companies that you're working with? Like you go in, you start working with the company and they're like, and you're like, holy shit, they don't have X. What is the X? It's different, but there, 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 there's some overlap. Um, but it's, it's, it's close in a lot of ways. Um, it's, a repeatable sales process where there is a goal for the for every interaction. Um, most people are flying blind, and sales is not an improvisational exercise. It can't be. Um, is there what what part of what part of that process did they not have repeatable? I mean, you're you're saying they don't have a repeatable process. So in, in in my mind, I'm hearing well, there's like you know, fifty different things in the in the process. Like could be which one of those is most likely to be screwed up or not in place um and let me reframe my answer and this may because it's going to be i mean look some companies have four steps in their process some companies have 50 steps in their process yeah. the key is that if oh my if god is, i you've really seen a 50 step sales process i'd be like i mean i guess it's a, a you know look if, i guess if you're boeing right and you're selling jet, right. jets then okay i got it and it, it depends it, it depends on what you want to qualify as a step, right? But what I mean is they're missing a process. It's being able to go into a meeting and know what to ask for, right? What do I want to accomplish today? And what am I going to ask for next? And then how do I ask? Those three, those three questions, every sales rep should be able to answer those three questions before they go into a meeting and too many of them can't. So that's where I see most people missing is just even a rough framework of here's what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm going to do discovery, right? And discovery is a place where most people miss. They don't spend enough time there. Everybody's in too much of a hurry. And you miss too many opportunities to, to sell when you don't spend enough time in discovery. Discovery is the selling part of the process. Um, but it's not knowing what to ask for. It's not knowing how to ask. And the companies who have something repeatable, a skeleton of a framework, even though there might be some nuance with every, with every client, with every customer, um, they they fall apart. They don't have anything to lean on and they go out and they make sales calls for the sake of making sales calls without any clear objective. Forget the upfront contract. We don't even know where to start with that. It's just, Oh, I made my calls today. Oh, I asked for the decision maker today. Like it is just a lack of an awareness of where they, what they're trying to accomplish right now and where they want to go next. And, and that's where, I mean, you, you see this too. I, I'm going to turn that around on you. I mean, what do you guys notice is, is different. Or are you noticing anything different or are you, are you having the same experience as me? I have pretty much the same similar experience. So I'm going to have let Richard answer this one since he got away. I, with I have the same one. <laughs> like I don't, I don't have a very different answer to that. So. <laughs> well, that just shows you that Jeff knows what he's talking about, Richard. It's his answer is so similar to that. But I, I just, I, so Jeff, do you, do you think because, you know, your, your name is Jeff and Gittimer's name is Jeff. That's why he goes by Gittimer. <laughs> uh, he had it first. Let me be very clear about that. He's way older than I am. Um, but uh, yeah, he's uh, the guy is just, I mean, he's a classic. He's a legend, right? So you've been spending a lot of time on, uh, <clears throat> on Clubhouse, right? Fair amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, tell everybody how you're using it to the degree you're comfortable and, and what your kind of plan and your, and your process is is there but what i really want to know is how do you decide what to put down in order to pick this new thing up and then how and why might somebody try to monetize clubhouse because mm. that that's the part now that's like okay i can get on there i can do all these things i see bits and pieces and like lots of indirect ways to monetize What's the direct path to revenue from a content creator or host like yourself? I don't know the answer to that question as it relates to Clubhouse specifically. Um, what did I put down to pick up Clubhouse? Um, not a whole lot. It's still pretty additive right now. And I'm in the middle of a, of a beta, essentially. I want to see what it's all about. Um, when I early, it was really actually it was late December, early January, I was talking to some people and um, I've got my group of, of friends and colleagues and we kind of bat around ideas together. And, and it occurred to me that I wanted to do more in the form of live interactive 
whether it was training, webinars, whatever it was, I wanted to be more accessible. It occurred to me um, late last year when I started reaching out to people, right? And, and Scott, you came on the Why and the Buy about a year, eh, six months ago or so. And you made kind of an offhanded comment, which I thought was really funny. You're like, you know, you're a guy with like 15% of my audience. I have like seven times more followers than you do, right? And um, you do, and you've earned that. And there are all kinds of reasons why. But what I recognized as I was reaching out to some people at the end of last year, they're like, oh man, thanks for that compliment, Jeff. It means a ton coming from you. I've been paying attention to your stuff, following your podcast, your blog for like four years. I'm like, well, where the hell have you been? Because I was taught, that if you just put stuff out there and you interact with people, I wasn't shy, right? But I don't live on social media. So a lot of my clients aren't even on social media, you know? So I'm putting stuff out there, trying to grow, trying to leave that uh, trail of a personal brand so that I'm proud of what people find when they look me up. And I'm like, where is everybody? And so I talked to some people. I said, hey, maybe it's an access thing. Maybe people feel like I'm just dropping stuff and then running or, you know, whatever. They like what I have to say, but I'm not around to hear people comment about it. Okay, I don't know. Well, let's do more live stuff. And I was actually talking to Will Barron for his show, um, right? First part of January and, and just talking to him before we started recording. He's like, hey, have you heard of Clubhouse? I said, yeah, I have, um, I have a friend who offered me an invitation, but I don't know what to do with it. And he says, it sounds like exactly what you're talking about. So give it a shot. You know, what do you have to lose? It's free. And so I said, okay. So I get on there and Scott, you and I got on right around the same time. And I remember trading messages with, with you and not knowing what to do with it because there were a yeah. lot of people giving terrible advice. And there were yeah. a lot of people talking about how much of a distraction it is. And I said, you know what? I'm not an early adopter. But Scott Lee's told me, that I should think less and just do more. So um, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to see what this is all about. I love it. And you have, and you host a show on, on Saturday mornings, you bring a bunch of other great guests and, and, and co-hosts in there. And so, you know, you've, you've got a, you've got a thing going now. And mm -hmm. the thing that, um, the thing that I love that you mentioned is the word accessibility, mm -hmm. because to me, accessibility is a differentiator big time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you can set yourself apart in, in our world. Um, and I don't mean access necessarily to, you know, content. I mean, to you as a person, mm -hmm. right. And as you put it, this like live interaction, this, this dialogue, whether it's a phone call or a webinar or clubhouse or, or things like that. Um, so I, I'm excited by what you're doing there. I was hoping that you had a good answer for the monitor. <laughs> piece. I'll have to come back to that um because as richard knows you know what, whatever i i do i'm always trying to think well how can i make a nickel off of this and if i can't make a nickel off of it i'm not sure that it's worth it at the moment so. well, I, I think the access leads to the engagement that leads to the money i don't For sure it, the, there's there's you know? indirect paths to revenue but i am impatient and i also need and want a direct path to revenue so i got we got to figure that one out um, I've got some ideas for things and I've talked to you about what I'm trying to do there. And, and I think, you know, every Saturday morning and look, I'm not interested in spending every Saturday on clubhouse, right? Um, at least not all day, but I can hop on for an hour and chat with people. I can hop on for an hour and, and be accessible. And what I've done is, is recruit some people to get on and I've got this room for four hours on a Saturday morning and every hour we change hosts. And it's yeah. like one of the things that um, when you I, you see that Richard, that's how he scales it. <laughs> yes. And, and my first couple of times on Clubhouse, it reminded me of being in my car in orthopedic medical device sales, driving around, listening to ESPN radio, listening yeah. to talk radio. It's like you got different segments. You break every 10 minutes or so and you reset the room, bring people back. You know, they had commercials, they don't have commercials, at least yet. Um, and, you know, just giving me an opportunity to talk about whatever I'm doing talk about whatever I'm up to um, and then pass the mic to somebody else. And now we've created a space where I think a lot of executives on Saturday mornings are in their offices and they could listen to another podcast or they could listen to a live interactive discussion that maybe they just want to hop into. Yeah. Or I know people are like, Hey, I'm driving my kids to practice or I'm, you know, one person say that she had to go to, she had to drive across the, the, the state, you know, um, to take, uh, meet her son at college or something like that for a basketball game. And it's just like, I'm just, I'm listening. This is great stuff. It's better than any kind of radio station I could find. So creating a place for executives who don't have a place to go right now, uh, creating a place for them to hear about, 
you know, topics that are pertinent to them. And instead of being yeah, called 17, the, raise your the, hand. The, now that we're having this conversation, like now all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, how come there isn't a commercial during Clubhouse? You oh, totally can have a, a, a live commercial vendor name drop, little blurb. Boom. There you go. Now you got, now you got a sponsor. And, 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 your, and, and your sponsor knows that it's going to get heard, right? Yeah. Like, Oh, I hadn't thought I hadn't thought of that before, but now now Jeff just gave us the idea, Richard. So yeah. you know, you know, you know what's really interesting is what is the critical mass, right? What is the number of people you need to have in that room before that um, before that ad becomes valuable, right? Before that read becomes valuable. Don't know because it's different. Now what you have is a much smaller number of people. You know, then w what we'll see a LinkedIn post or, or it, whatever, it much, much on, smaller. It depends on the who's in there and the intent. I mean, we've sold sponsorships for years to surf and sales events, and there's less than 20 people at mm -hmm. the event. And we've had six figure deals come about two sponsors through that. We've had people hire each other, right? We've, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the ROI is there. So, you know, you got your room, you got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people in there. Yeah. That's critical mass potentially. I, I, I agree. I yeah. agree. And that's, and, and you know, what's interesting, it's not the same 50 people, right? So you look in, in you know, the, the bottom half of that room changes over quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So you may have a peak of 48 people in your room, but there's probably 120 people that have gone through that room. So, yeah, exactly. in, yeah. you know, so I mean, to, I mean, I think we we'll, we'll come up with an answer to your question. We just keep talking about this, Scott. We'll come up with an answer. Yeah, that's the goal. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> that's why I'm asking. Jeff, I gotta pull, I'm gonna pull this out of this and ask a question and tell you not to be a fence sitter. You got to give an answer. You ready? All right. Hardest job in sales right now. <laughs> Frontline sales manager. Okay. Right. Now, I, I, that, this is a, a different answer than we have heard uh, recently. So, to talk to us about that. Give give your logic and explanation of why. Serving multiple masters. Um, and often being the person who has to deliver bad news way more often than they deliver good news. Now, those uh, masters being the people that you're serving and the people that are above you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I believe that as a frontline manager, your team, those are your customers now. You don't have customers. You shouldn't. There are a lot of player coaches out there, but you should be really focused on leading a team. And when you lead a team, your team are your customers. You're trying to give them everything that they need, the coaching, the leadership, the tools if necessary, um, the support if necessary, uh, whenever necessary to help them excel. You also have people you report to and you need to be the translator right? And every great manager I've ever had has stopped the shit from rolling downhill as well as pushed stuff back up the hill, right? And it's also contained some of the, the stuff that, hey, look, the higher ups don't need to know we're struggling right now. I'm just going to, I'm going to soften this a little bit. Like you are almost always in a no-win situation. You're asked to do more than you're capable of doing in the 24 hours a day that we all have. And often the stuff that is most urgently placed upon you is the least important stuff yeah. you need to do. And um, so that's why I think it's, the, it, it, it's a war on all fronts. And I like, um, I like that showing some love to the sales managers out there, Richard. Yeah, that's very, that's a very different answer. Let me, now let me ask you this question between the role of AE and SDR, which job is harder? It depends. Oh, come on. come on. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not being a consultant. <laughs> um, okay. I've never been an SDR. I was a full bag AE, which meant that I was responsible for everything, right? They didn't even call an, 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 an account executive. I was just a sales rep, right? Which means you're responsible for so many things. And that can be really, really difficult because there's so many, I mean, how many balls can you keep up in the air, in the air at the same time? And I'm going to get to an answer. Let me just explain my justification for where I'm going. Okay. BDR, SDR, hard job, constant repetition, constant rejection, Actually, more often than rejection, you just get nothing. Like, give me rejection. Tell me no. I, I said this um, the other day. Um, I said, a no answer is better than no answer. 
right? Like if you tell me no, at least you've proactively, yeah. um, you know, told me something. I can go with that. You tell me I'm too expensive. I think that's a buying signal because that's emotional enough of a decision or emotional enough of a response that I have some something, some momentum I can use one way or another. But the the no response, man, just pound your head against the wall. That's really, really hard. But you know what? At least that's all you got to do. So I know some companies, uh, I've, I've heard of some companies where SDR is great and they give you clear paths and clear objectives to hit and everything else. And I know some other BDR, SDR functions where they ask you to do everything that no one else wants to do or no one else wants to do. I think that's pretty shitty. Um, so I'm going to say that um, SDR, uh, between AE and SDR, I'd way rather be an AE. Cool. All right, ne next question. What do you think? It's, 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 it, in fact, Scott, this might need to be our lightning round at the end of every episode. It, it, there's no, you're going to get me to tell you something one way or another. Yeah, I, I, I can feel the bright lights. What, okay. What do you think uh, of the player coach role? It's terrible. But tell, and, tell everybody, tell everybody why, Jeff. And, and I'm, I agree. I'm sure Richard does as well. Yes. I, think it's, I think it's horrible, but it still fucking happens all the time. Yep. It's happening all the time. Tell everybody why the player coach team lead kind of model is garbage. Well, okay. Can we, can we set some, some boundaries around this is, can we eliminate the possibility that the manager could be perceived to be in competition with his or her reps, because that's a special kind of hell to put reps in. And I don't know if it happens often enough, right? Where there, can we at least assume that the territories or the, the, the way that things are broken up, there's no competition there. You can assume well, anything you want. I would yeah. hope so, but okay. Well, no, because I've heard horror stories where it's like, yeah. Well, wait a second, uh, not, the managers. Yeah. You know, oh, that's my it. deal because I own Michigan. No, that's my deal. I'm the right. rep. I own Michigan. It's a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's terrible. Um, so if it's a manager who is managing territories around them, but also has their own, that I can at least. Sometimes you just got to do it. Okay. But if you're like, okay, I own Michigan, but you own Oakland County. Well, Oakland County's in Michigan. So, well, uh, I'm going to take the commission on this. Like that's, that's just, that's terrible. That's not a situation anybody should be in. Um, but as a player coach, you are constantly um, afflicted by uh, your boundaries being infringed upon and encroached upon you are not you not only is it difficult enough to be a frontline manager for all the reasons i mentioned just a few minutes ago but now you have an ae job to do as well how many jobs are you supposed to do at the same time and you know when you do the work you're not your work is not scalable among the eight different states that you cover or whatever it is um so you can't do the work for all those people and oh by the way the people you lead not only do you have to do your job but those people are begging you to stop the shit from rolling downhill and protect some of their shit from rolling uphill and fighting that war on all fronts um Frontline manager, when you're only, and I say that lovingly, when that is the only th responsibility that you have, is hard enough. Now I got to carry a bag. Now I'm responsible to a quota. And by the way, okay, let's say I'm the, the Midwest regional manager and I also cover the state of Michigan. Who's giving me the help I need as a rep in the state of Michigan, right? Who's stopping the shit from rolling downhill on me? Like that, forget it. Like that, that's just, can't, you're setting people up to fail. Can't we just say out loud though that, the reason it's a terrible idea is because the, the executives are too cheap to actually understand the value of like bringing in another personnel. Right. Well, and and it, it comes right down to that. Like, Oh, well, if you can't do it, we'll find someone to, who can. Right. And you get turnover Good and luck. it's like, let's, yeah, let's throw, let's throw more money at it. Okay. We'll give this, this person a few thousand extra dollars or whatever. We'll just roll through it. And then there's turnover. It runs rampant. And, and my, my advice is you just quit managed. right there. Like, yeah. sorry, you know, I'm done. By the way, by the time you hire someone to replace me, you could have, you know, you've lost so much more money anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a dynamic though we shouldn't forget where um, some people who are individual contributors get pushed into this team lead role and they don't really want to be a manager. Right. And then there's the dynamic of the people who get pushed into that role who desperately want to be a manager. And what ends up happening is the person gravitates towards the functions that they're in the mood for and that they want to do. So mm. the person who's like desperately going to be a manager skews all their activities towards leading and neglects the selling function. And the person who 
really doesn't want to be responsible for, for people, neglects all the people and skews all their functions towards, towards selling. So it, it doesn't, I've never really seen it work. I really don't understand. And to Richard's point, like it's a way of kind of not ponying up for another headcount. Mm -hmm. Right. And just trying to squeeze more and more and more out of what we've got by throwing a couple extra nickels at somebody and saying, Hey, now you're a team lead. And, and we, we, you have to stop pretending that the leadership job is just an extension of the territory job, right? These are different positions. There are, there are different job descriptions altogether. So you can't just take your best seller and say, okay, you're the leader now. Yep. Most times, most times that top seller is not equipped to be the leader. They're equipped to lead by example sometimes, right? But you know, so often when you think about the support that your frontline sellers need from their manager, it requires that manager codifying why the things that worked for her worked. Not just saying, do it like I did. This is what I always did. It worked for me. It should work for you because that's, that's not how it goes. So there's a, another level, another layer of insight that goes into, huh, why did that work? And then when I understand why it worked, I can show you how you can do it best rather than just telling me to copy or telling you to copy me, which is why everybody's out there looking for the best five words to start an email with. And none of them will work for you. None of them will work for you because they're not your words. But if you ask someone, you know, you ask Richard, what are the five best words that'll work? And Richard is a smart enough guy. Richard's going to say, look, these worked for me. This is why I think they worked. So take that concept, use your five words and come back to me and tell me how they worked. And maybe we can learn something together. See, that is something that's not happening because managers are asked to do more than they should. The wrong, they're, they're not asked to do more than they should as much as they're asked to do the wrong things in the wrong priority. And they're not given the ability to coach, interact, and really develop an understanding of the, the, on their team so that the talent can, can really grow. That's the best snippet right there. That last line was like, oh, that's a little video snippet we need right there, right? So, I'm glad if, I was looking at the camera. If you knew how to do video snippets, it would be. It would be. So... Uh, Thank you so much. And again, a quick shout out to our to our sponsors of uh, Salesforce Revenue Cloud, Lead411 and Gong.io and their upcoming event for Celebrate, uh, which I believe is happening in the next week and a half. I think, Scott, you said March 23rd, right? March 23rd, yeah. March 23rd. So uh, please check those folks out. And Jeff, our last question to you is, uh, what could we answer for you? What brilliant sunshine coming through the clouds advice would you like to hear from the one and only Scott Lees? What do you mean me? What about you? Maybe you <laughs> hear the advice from you. You know, um, I don't know that I have any, like, I don't know that I have any questions. I, I'm, I love coming on and having conversations like, and I'm not meaning to dodge this. I pay very close attention to what you guys are doing because I like the work that you do. And I like watching the way that you grow. Like, I believe there are like, and I haven't written any, but I believe there are case studies to why someone grows effectively why, with their, um, not just with their business, but with their following and with some of the things that you're doing. So, you know, Scott, you know this, cause I send you text messages that you don't ask for. And um, you, you know, I, I try to pay compliments when, when I see good things happening and I try Try to make sure that um, I'm clear to people that I'm learning from them and, and you guys and, and what you're doing with Surf and Sales, with this podcast, with both of your businesses. You know, it's just really interesting to see um, what's going on and, and, and what's working. Um, I and, you know, I'm in a place now with my business where I'm figuring out how to scale a little bit and how to be a little bit more reproducible. Um, at least with some of the templates that I'm using and people that I'm um, working with and, and things like that. And, and I, uh, I owe a lot of that to the, um, just uh, the nuggets that I hear from each of you and, and, and things like that. There's a, uh, you guys are tremendously accessible and vulnerable. And I think that is uh, worth, worth commending. You don't see it very often. I think that's uh, one of the reasons you're growing. So I, I don't know. Okay, oh, here's a question. When can we do this again? And we didn't even have to be up for a podcast, but when can we just bullshit like this again? Maybe with some tequila or some bourbon or something. Now we're talking. Now, <laughs> what, what are you doing at five o'clock tonight? Five o'clock. Yeah. Why don't, why, don't we, why don't we put together just a, you know, a, a sales consultants round table happy hour and we like just it. Shoot, shoot the shit amongst ourselves. Yep. Not recorded, not broadcast. How about that? No holds barred. 
and yeah. two drink minimum. <laughs> right. That's right. Well, it, it's two drink minimum before we turn on the can the mic. Before you get in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you have to demonstrate you've had two drinks before you enter the room. We'll just do two shots right at the right at the start. There we go. Right. And we all know we're all on the same page. If you want to get a head start on top of that, more power to you. <laughs> awesome. I, I'd be down for that one. So, so awesome. Much, so thank you so much for, for coming in, Jeff. And we really, really appreciate it. So um, thanks, guys. We will uh, definitely catch up with you soon. Yeah. Appreciate you having me.